related, but we're not dealing directly with the text. And then we'll start to make our transition to Kant. So no reading assignment over the weekend. Um, on probably no reading assignment for Wednesday either. I'll probably have a handout on with some quotes from Kant, a sort of background to the groundwork that we'll talk about um, either Wednesday or next Friday. So for next Friday, we'll start um, just the beginning of the groundwork. And so Kant has a short little preface at the beginning, um, pages three through eight. So you should probably read that for next Friday. And then I'm, I'm anticipating the following Monday. So a week from Monday, we'll probably get started with the first section of the groundwork. So that's pages 9 through 20. So if you want to get started, yeah. 1 to 3, 9 to 20. 1 to 3, sorry, 3 to 8 is the preface. 9 to 20 is the first part. We were talking about sovereignty by acquisition and there were three important points to emphasize here. The first is that the sovereignty that we're talking about, whether it's acquired or instituted, is the same. And so the sovereignty um, that gets created through either of these methods is the same. So the rights of the sovereign uh, are the same, however it comes about. Second point was that this, and of course the rights of the sovereign are um, visible, unconditional, and irrevocable. Okay, the second point is that maybe despite what the name of acquisition might suggest, uh, sovereignty is never acquired unilaterally for others. Even in the case of sovereignty by acquisition, it's the contract that's the source of the obligation on the part of individuals to obey the sovereignty. So in the case of sovereignty by acquisition, we have one individual, it's going to be an artificial person, of course, who's much more powerful than everyone else. That's the person who becomes sovereign in the case of sovereignty by acquisition. But I say again, it's not something that's acquired unilaterally. It's not something that the sovereign just takes. It's something that's given to him. It's something that uh, we all do. Of course, we do it under coerced circumstances for fear, but that's no different between sovereignty by acquisition and sovereignty by institution. The difference is only the source of the fear. Okay, and finally, repeating what I just said, that the difference is the source of this threat, uh, and the source of the threat um, that leads us to transfer our right of nature and uh, seek security. Okay, so we discussed that in the case of sovereignty by acquisition, the source of the threat is going to be one person. That's the one that it makes sense to transfer our right of nature to. And of course we talked about how that's possible on the assumption that Hobbes makes that natural persons are relatively equal. The answer is, it's not a natural person, it's an artificial person who's much more powerful than everyone else, namely someone who's already sovereign. So the case of sovereignty by acquisition is when an already existing sovereign acquires new or more subjects. Because his power is a threat to their security, and they covenant to obey. Uh, and I'll say one last time um, that they do this 
out of fear in order to hopefully uh, acquire, uh, in order to establish more security for themselves. And it's that consent, it's that act of covenanting that is what transfers the right of nature to the sovereign. Questions about that? Yes. I think you have to say like affection. It's not like an action that you fear, but you just want to be a part of a different kind of world. So you switch. Well, um, it is possible. So, I mean, you yes, you've asked like a kids. similar question many times, and finally we'll be able to get an answer to this today. But but what but we can see what the answer is going to be officially already. So what would he say about this case? You can't say that you wouldn't really want to change covenants because you can't judge it to be any better than yours. Well, you wouldn't want to, but somebody might desire to. And what would he say about that desire? Uh, be more obligated to be Yeah, yeah. I mean, people might want to do that. People might, they might have a desire to do that. They might actually do that, but they don't have a right to do that. So this is something that you're not entitled to do. I mean, Hobbes' claim here is not that people could never be unjust. His claim is that they shouldn't, that it's not rational to. That sometimes people are going to act on their maybe immediate desires to go over where the grass appears greener, but it's irrational to do that. It's unjust to do that. It violates the laws of nature to do that. People might still do it at their peril. And you remember, I mean, at their peril, you remember that um, in his reply to the fool, Hobbes says it might on occasion be possible to act unjustly and wind up doing better. But that's not the, I mean, but if that happens, it's just because you got lucky. And the correct perspective from which to evaluate the rationality of that course is in anticipation where you're not sure whether you're going to do it. But, but, but there's a problem here, and that's what we're going to get to. All right, but there's one more one more apparent problem um, with this idea of sovereignty by acquisition. So the picture is supposed to be that the more powerful person, like the already existing sovereign, is a threat to you, maybe you're outside of that commonwealth, still in a state of nature, you don't yet have a sovereign. And the powerful sovereign is a threat to you. And so in order to establish your security, you're going to give up your right of nature, just as we did in the case of sovereignty by institution. But now in this case, there is one person who is the main source of threat to you. And therefore, Hobbes thinks, it's in your rational self-interest to give up your right of nature to that individual, rather than choosing arbitrarily who's going to be the sovereign. It makes sense to have that person be the sovereign. Okay. But my question to you now is, um, how should I put this? Um, how is that possibly going to establish your security? I mean, this individual is so much more powerful than you that what you do here is make him more powerful. You give up your, you transfer your right of nature to him. How's that securing yourself at all? Yeah. If everybody else does it with you, there's kind of like one thing and everything. Maybe everybody else has done it. So we're imagining a situation where, where there's a commonwealth. Everybody there has transferred, everybody there is a subject. Everybody there has transferred their right to the sovereign. And now you're wandering around through the forest and you come upon this commonwealth. 
which collectively, through the sovereign, is much more powerful than you can't possibly fight off that army that's commanded by the sovereign. Okay, so how is it how is it helping anything for you to transfer your right of nature to that sovereign? Uh, everyone was in this commonwealth together where they each gave up you know, their power. I guess it would just be under the assumption that there'd be a covenant that the sovereign would not destroy you or kill you. Cannot be. Cannot be. There cannot be. A, I mean, the in the case of sovereignty by institution, there is a covenant made individuals with one another, but not with the sovereign. The sovereign is not party to a covenant. Now, maybe what you're saying is, in this case, maybe what you do is you give up your <coughs> right of nature to the sovereign on the condition that you don't die or get that he not kill you. All right. Well, so can that be right? I mean, this makes it look so. I mean. That seems to be the only way that you get something out of this. Right? The sovereign has the power to kill you. You give him more power, and that's supposed to help you. How? Well, maybe by getting the sovereign to give up his right to kill you. Well, you see that this is a very, very delicate point here. Hobbes has to think, on the one hand, that you get something back, but it can't be the sovereign's promise to do anything for you in the future. It can't be, remember, remember what a covenant is as opposed to a contract. A contract is a mutual transference of rights. A covenant is a mutual transference of rights regarding something in the future. Okay, well, so, you certainly are covenanting with the sovereign. You're giving up your right of nature, including your right to decide for yourself in the future what to do in the future. It can't be that the sovereign is making a covenant with you. We saw the argument last time why that wouldn't be binding. But I do think, for Hobbes, the sovereign is making a contract with you. So I do think that the sovereign, in the case of sovereignty by acquisition, is giving something up. But it can't be a covenant. So take a look at what he says on 131. I, I say again, this is a very delicate point here. Because on the one hand, you need to get something back in order for it to be in your rational self-interest to give up your right of nature in this situation. On the other hand, there can't be anything that binds the sovereign. Should I say that again, or do you see the problem? Yeah. Couldn't you just argue that it's in the sovereign's best interest not to kill you after you defend your right of nature? Maybe, but why? Well, I mean, if you're alive, you can tell you what to do. If you're dead, then you can't. Right, so maybe his interest will be served by having more subjects. Yeah. Because in the, in the state of nature, isn't the rational self is the same even for a sovereign as everyone else? So when, when the state of nature, mm -hmm. Pop says it's in your head or your rational interest to pursue peace. Isn't the state of that same Well, so Hobbes assumes that, take, let's take a step back and think about um, how the sovereign, how anyone, decides what's good or bad based on their desires. Hobbes at core is a subjectivist about value, and so the sovereign, like anybody else, is going to call what is good the things he has a desire for. Okay, so you might get a really irrational sovereign who simply has um, unpredictable and unstable desires that lead him to act simply on impulse. At